Eucharistic Thoughts from the Blessed Sacrament Prayer Book by Father Lassance on page 1067. Part 1. All that is good and pure in human love is realized on a transcendent scale in the divine love. There are many touching tales in poetry founded on the prose of real life, telling how kings and princes assumed a lowly disguise in order to win the true love of lowly maidens who loved them for their own sake and not for the rank and wealth which they were startled and grieved to discover and from which they shrank when their royal suitors insisted on raising them to their own height and sharing everything with them. In like manner, the divine lover of our souls has descended to our level, has disguised himself in our lowly human nature, that he may win our familiar and tender love. He too will elevate his low-born spouse to a crown of heavenly glory. Part 2. In his dealings with souls, God does not confine himself to the barely necessary. The poet's clever phrase, le superflu chose si necessare, has its meaning in the spiritual life. The Creator does not, if we may speak thus, scruple what seems to be mere waste in the material world. Glorious vegetation grows where no man lives to admire it, and enjoy it. Exquisite flowers bloom in the wilderness that gain their end if once or twice in many generations of flowers a chance traveler feels his heart touched with the tender thoughts of the Creator at seeing their beauty and their loneliness. So too, with all the applications of the plenteous redemption that our Redeemer wrought for us, with all the thoughtful ministrations of the Church, and especially with all that regards the sacrament of love in which Jesus seems to have gone too far, to have made himself too accessible, to have exceeded what might have been deemed possible as the uttermost mercy and condensation even of that heart that has loved us with an everlasting love. Part 3 our Lord himself seemed to have abandoned his love of poverty when he instituted the sacrament of our altars. He ordered his apostles, St. Peter and St. John, to prepare for this great event, a large supper room furnished and adorned, for he knew that our poor human nature is influenced by external circumstances. Let us beware of echoing that cry of the traitor, why this waste? Would it not be better to give God's poor the price of this incense, these tapers, these vestments, these flowers? This devotion will not lessen but increase the prerequisites of the poor. Luxury and sin and passion and intemperance save the vast tribute lavished on these, and the poor can be well provided for. God cares little for these external splendors, but he deigns to care much for the love of our poor hearts, which these symbols and sacrifices indicate, excite, exercise, fortify, and gratify. God is so good as to accept these little tokens of our love, and our love grasp eagerly at these opportunities of making some sacrifice of doing something to prove the sincerity of its devotion to the Beloved. Part 4 It is well to excite our fervor and holy communion and to rebuke our coldness while praying before the tabernacle by contrasting our hearts with those of many whom we know and who feel and act so differently. We may sometimes make a Eucharistic litany like the following which might be readily extended, which is here given, without a beginning and without an end. St. Peter, who made the first great public act of faith in the Blessed Eucharist, when others found the saying hard and would not hear it, obtained for me an increase of faith. St. John, who with St. Peter prepared the large supper room, 
furnished for the First Communion of the Church, pray for me that I too may claim the title of the disciple whom Jesus loved, I too whom he vouchsafes a closer union than yours when you leaned upon his breast. St. Paul, who made yourself an evangelist here and here only, in chronicling minutely the institution of the Blessed Eucharist, obtain for me the grace to discern more perfectly the body of the Lord. St. Thomas, obtain for me the grace to say with some share of your glowing faith, my Lord and my God, especially when I genuflect before the tabernacle. St. Ambrose, St. Chrysostom, all ye fathers and doctors of the Church who proclaimed so eloquently your belief in the Blessed Eucharist, pray for me that I may glory in the same faith. St. Thomas Aquinas, obtain for me some share in the thoughts and feelings of your great heart and mind when you first sang the Lauda Sion and the Adorate Devote. Blessed Amilda, who died so sweet a death in the ecstasy of your first communion, obtain for me a little yearning of your love. Saint Stanislaus, whose ardent longing made Jesus give himself to you by the ministry of angels, help me to feel more as you felt, since I believed what you believed. Saint Aloysius, pray that I may feel at the altar some of the joyful love that filled your innocent heart when you received your first communion from the hand of St. Charles. St. Margaret Mary, pray that I may begin to atone to the heart of Jesus, so loving and so little loved, for the coldness of many hearts, especially my own. I unite this communion, this visit, this prayer, with the communion's visits, prayers, of all the pious faithful over the world, and in particular with those of our own simple people here at home and of the holy inmates in our convents, at home, and everywhere. Praised and loved forever be the most adorable sacrament of the altar. Amen. And now continuing with the Blessed Sacrament Prayer Book by Father Lassans, on page 716, the heart of Jesus, full of goodness and love. Behold our Lord going round among the villages of Galilee, doing good and curing all. Ask the grace to realize the unspeakable kindness and the love of the heart of Jesus. In the parables, our Lord himself puts before us the most touching pictures of the goodness and love of his sacred heart. He represents himself as the good shepherd, carrying home the lost sheep on his shoulders. As the good Samaritan pouring oil into the wounds of the poor afflicted traveler, as the loving father of the prodigal son, hurrying with open arms to welcome back the penitent. In the Acts of the Apostles, we are told how we went about doing good and healing all. The Gospel narrative is one unbroken history of his goodness and love. He seems to have a special predilection for the wretched and afflicted, the blind and the lame, the leopardous and the paralyzed gather around him with instinctive confidence for help in their afflictions. For has he not proclaimed that blessed are they that mourn? Moved by the widow's tears, he gives her back her only son alive. He raises the dead Lazarus from the tomb at the piteous entreaty of his sisters. His love and his goodness towards children are remarkable. He blesses and caresses them and bids them to come to him with boundless confidence. For sinners, he has nothing but words of gentlest kindness. He undertakes a painful journey to win over a poor Samaritan woman, when everyone around would stone to death the wretched woman taken in adultery. He saves her and converts her with a word of love, and who shall tell the wonder of his dealings with the sinner Magdalene? 
Even the traitor Judas he addresses as his friend, and uses every art to win him over, even unto the very end. And where can words be found to adequately picture the exquisite goodness and love of the Eucharistic heart of Jesus in the tabernacle, or to tell of all the world of the goodness which she welcomes back the sinner in the sacrament of penance? Whilst ever in his heavenly home, he acts as an advocate and a mediator with his Father, warding off with the wealth of tenderness and power the terrors of the Eternal Father's wrath about to fall upon the head of the guilty man. We must try to imitate in some degree the charity and goodness of the Sacred Heart. This we may do in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. In our thoughts, do we try to see the good rather than the evil in those around us? To fix our thoughts upon the good points rather than dwell upon their weaknesses and faults? We ourselves have got our failings as well as our good qualities. We should like others to dwell upon the latter rather than the former. Are we guilty of rash judgments? Do we attribute sinister motives or do we try to judge others' actions in the light of Christian charity and love? In our words, do we try not alone to think, but also to speak well of others, especially behind their backs? It is base and cowardly to say of another in his absence what we should never venture to assert before his face. Be tender of the reputation of your neighbor, as you would wish him to be careful of your own. The best plan is to make it an invaluable rule, never, if possible, to say a hard word of anyone. Then be kindly, courteous, and considerate in your words to others. In our actions, negatively and positively. Negatively, by never doing what would hurt or injure others. Positively, by showing them all goodness and consideration in our dealings with them. Furthermore, we must help our neighbor spiritually and temporally we must assist the poor, the sick, the afflicted. We must pray for the conversion of sinners and be full of tender pity for the suffering children of the Sacred Heart in Purgatory. Thus shall we imitate and become dear to him whose heart is full of goodness and love. Amen.